White House spokesman Josh Earnest says the president thinks congressional action now would be premature. The president wants Congress to ensure that our negotiators have the time and space that they need to try to reach an agreement by the end of June. Opponents of the deal, including key Democrats, want Congress to vote on anything that lifts sanctions. Earnest acknowledges there's some convincing to do, but adds some Republicans are so opposed to a deal for political reasons, they frankly don't care about its merits. Israel is not happy that Russia is lifting its ban on the delivery of a sophisticated air defense missile system to Iran. Russia signed the $800 million contract to sell Iran the S-300 missile system in 2007, but later suspended its delivery because of strong objections from the U.S. and Israel. The decree signed Monday by Russian President Vladimir Putin allows for the delivery of the missiles. Gary Bauer of American Values comments. It's a very, very bad situation. We should be angry at at Moscow for doing this, but we should be more angry at the President of the United States for what he's allowed Iran to get away with, including threats of a second Holocaust, while American negotiators continue to sit there at the table for two years, making concession after concession on the Iranian nuclear program. Well, the next president will have his or her plate full of foreign policy issues. Republican Senator Marco Rubio of Florida is now officially running for president. Tony Winton has more. Speaking on a conference call with donors, Florida's junior senator says he is uniquely qualified to make the case that the Republican Party can best defend the American dream. Rubio took on leading Democrat Hillary Clinton, saying the 2016 presidential race should be about the future, not the past. Rubio faces tough challenges getting the GOP nomination, not the least of which is from fellow Floridian Jeb Bush, who is also expected to make a White House run. Bush was also one of Rubio's political mentors. Tony Winton, Miami. And he's not officially a candidate, although the New York Times and other publications believe Jeb Bush is probably running for president. The former Florida governor tells Focus on the Family that we need to take a stand for religious freedom. We ought to figure out a way how we can sort out the fact that people aren't going to be discriminated against under the law and that people have the right space to um, act on their conscience. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. It is a non-negotiable point because if we start, you know, what other element of the Bill of Rights is next? If well, you to the First Amendment right, if that's gone, then what's next? You can read more of Jeb Bush's comments as well as overall election coverage at onenewsnow.com. It's been more than two years since the Bible miniseries debuted on the History Channel. Bill Bumpus reports it is still making an impact. The Emmy-nominated miniseries produced by husband and wife team Mark Burnett and Roma Downey was recently aired in Spanish on Telemundo with record-breaking ratings. It was the network's highest 8 p.m. premiere, reaching more than 3.2 million viewers. And I just think it speaks to... This great hunger for God that's sweeping across the nation. And to see the series after two years, remember we first premiered Easter of 2013, to see the series come out again in the Spanish market and do so well. It's just extraordinary. It's very, very encouraging. Downey believes the authenticity of the miniseries has a lot to do with its success. You know, I think in showing it in a way to make emotional connection with an audience, allowed these stories to seem relevant and inspirational to a contemporary audience. NBC is currently airing Burnett and Downey's latest series, A.D., The Bible Continues. I'm Bill Bumpus. For more on these stories and other issues of the day, visit onenewsnow.com. I pledge allegiance to the King of kings and to his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. One holy nation and a heavenly Father, grace, mercy, justice for all.
Okay, welcome back to the Investigative Journal on this April 13th, 2015 day on our calendar. I'm your host, Greg Anthony, and sitting right next to me is my co-host, my little dog, Miss Moose, who someone yesterday said looked like Old Yeller. Remember that old movie? Well, anyway, Miss Moose is here. She may add a few things to the show, and also I want to mention that... uh, I am about halfway through the Tony Alamo play uh, I'm writing, a script that I'm writing for the theater, and uh, it's no secret that I'm spending a lot of time on this story because it shows you uh, what social fascism is all about in this country. And uh, just to get back to the play, I think you'll find it quite interesting because what it will represent is a man who has been convicted of 175 years in jail. And really, it's a story about the Vatican versus the Bible. And when you start talking about that, people get turned off. But it's not only the Vatican versus the Bible. It shows you how the Vatican has infiltrated most every organization in our country, And you'll see it through the eyes of a man who's being persecuted for bringing that issue to light. So, uh, I'm going to go over his story again today, and I've found some interesting things to talk about. Uh, One, I want to bring his, most of his appeals, by the way, he's been in in prison now since uh, this Gestapo-like raid on this ministry took place in 2008. And I happened to be interviewing him for one of my other radio shows during that period of time. And uh, you can go back to my shows on arcticbeacon.com and get a lot of those old shows and see what he was talking about back then. And also, I found it quite interesting because I I did run across a couple FBI undercover agents who were hired to frame him. And I got their testimony on my radio shows too. Apparently the judges in the case uh, didn't think that was pertinent, and that testimony didn't get into his, what I call, a kangaroo trial, a kangaroo court. It was worse than that if you looked at what went on in Arkansas. Uh, my God, I, I, I don't want to live in a, a place where you, boy, can you believe what they do still in Arkansas? Well, they do it all over the country. Uh, but anyway, that's an, also an interesting story you can uh, go back and find on my website. And uh, today I want to talk, though, there's two things. One, most of his motions on appeal have been denied, so he's hanging on a string right now. Uh, And there's a couple, there's one out there, but I want to go back and look at uh, his motion for retrial, not right this moment, but in the second half hour, and see all the irregularities that went on. Uh, I've touched on most of them. First and foremost, the... Uh, four or five girls who testified against him who were basically coerced by the FBI. And uh, some have come out and recanted their testimony after this. Uh, Then I've interviewed others in the ministry who basically were asked to lie about him but wouldn't because they've known him for years and years and years and they decided not to. Uh, But anyway, today I wanted to go and talk about social fascism and how I came about this was I I found a a newsletter that was written on this case and it came from the American Information uh, Newsletter and uh, this uh, came out prior to his this was in June of 1996 so you're going to see now he this last raid that uh, finally put him in jail was a frame job. But that took place in 2008. And I said a long time ago, they'd been harassing this guy in this ministry for years. And this is really good because it goes back to June 1996, and you're going to see what was even going on prior to that and how uh, how this uh, writer, Lawrence Dawson, viewed it back in 1996, laying evidence to the fact that they had, this had been a witch hunt on this Christian ministry for years, and I said primarily because they had taken on the Vatican and told you the truth about this beast. 
Uh, it starts out with a great uh, Bible quote. I thought I'd read it. Ephesians 4, 14, 15. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. That's not, you know, when you think about it, uh, no true words are spoken as we live in these times of deceit. And one of the reasons we live in it, we're all getting an idea of really what's going on. And we, because of the information is being passed to and fro quickly. And we're seeing a lot more truth coming out. And we're seeing how we've been deceived. And for some people, it's difficult. Others take it on. And like a bull, uh, work hard to get to the bottom of really what's going on. But anyway, this uh, it, it t- the, the title of this, and it's really worth picking up this story and relating it to you because it gives you an idea of really what's going on and for how long. They've tried to take these people down. And it said anti-cult group directs federal agents in another religious persecution. And uh, like I said earlier, the rise of social fascism creates approved client status for some social groups. And the perception of other social groups as hated outsiders is apparently entering a new dangerous phase. Now, this was back in 96. Imagine what it's going on now. I mean, uh, just think about this. The ideology is now allowing private political groups to direct the power of the state against these hated outsiders to conduct what appears to be a fascistic persecution. The hatred can be demonized by propaganda and then killed with impunity was proven. Remember back in Waco, Texas in 1993? If you realize that the government's perception of the Branch Davidians in Waco as dangerous outsiders, worthy of deadly attack, was directed by an organization called the Cult Awareness Network, CAN. Now, CAN designates as cults religions which they disapprove of and which generate strong social cohesion and which weaken members' allegiances to secular institutions. Members of these so-called cults, they call the Alamo ministry a cult, they really call any Bible believer a cult. So basically, if you believe in the Bible and you don't believe that you have to go to the Vatican to get your soul saved, you are a cult within yourself, according to Ken. Now, I said a long time ago, if you do a real exhaustive study of what a cult is, There is no bigger cult in the world than the the Roman Catholic Church. And they are the ones calling everybody else a cult. It's their way they do business, so to speak. Now, members can, who basically was involved in also this last raid on the ministry of uh, the Alamo ministry, uh, members are said to be under the mind control of the leader because their beliefs often alienate them from the prevalent secular ideology. By can standards, the early church, the early Christians, I'm not talking about the Roman Catholic Church they began, but the early Christians would have been a cult. And the Apostle Paul, a dangerous cult leader. Yes. But it now appears that can has succeeded a second time to direct government agencies to persecute a group it defines as a cult and to imprison its dangerous cult leader, Tony Alamo. Admittedly a controversial figure in American Christianity, he began a street ministry in the 60s. Uh, now, I, you know, I did, what is a controversial figure? I mean, it, really, a controversial figure... In this case, is anyone who disagrees with the Vatican. It's that simple. Or basically uses the Bible instead of Catholic tradition to uh, uh, preach the word of God. 
But in this article, they uh, talked about, he said that, uh, and this is basically, he began street ministry in the 60s. And uh, why, what it was easy, and when he started to talk against the Vatican, Can had to get involved here, being their front man. Um, he took, uh, at, back at that time, uh, the dregs of society, took people off the street, people without viable living arrangements, including drug addicts, prostitutes, criminals, and homeless hippies, and integrated them into his church commune. Uh, and he said at that time, the pr- uh, this is a quote of his, their primary commitments were to spreading the gospel, winning new converts, and building the church. They were not interested in high wages and huge personal profits. Uh, whether a church, now, uh, that's what they said about it. But here, you know, um, so basically, uh, the monies from these the, the efforts were invested in other enterprises, which opened up new opportunities uh, for other destitute people. Uh, the commercial success of his ministry uh, brought the attention of Ken. Again, it's basically this, the, if you start figuring out a way to help a lot of people, they're going to come down on you. If you have a small little roadside ministry and you, you take your motor home and you go around, they're not going to bother you at all. So because Tony was successful, He's also a pretty good businessman. He put his money back into the ministry, and he, he built different churches. I mean, when you when you consider what he did compared to what the Vatican has done worldwide, it's like a drop in the ocean. But, see, the Vatican is concerned, and I said this a long time ago, even when I talked about certain things that John Paul II said about how they had to really wipe out any churches like this. That's basically what he was saying. He said it in kind of nicer words. But they don't want any drops in the ocean that are different than theirs. And so the commercial success of his ministry brought the attention of Ken, who, you know, accused him of holding his members as slaves and keeping them under mind control. Now, I interviewed a lot of these people, and it was far from the truth. I mean, that that is such a bogus lie when I, after talking to these people, that, uh, you know, once you get involved and you start seeing, go inside and see past the media, see past what the media did to him and what he does, what the media does to many people. I mean, what this article basically isn't just, you know, they're using Tony Alamo as an example, but it's happened to many, many people and many people that I've interviewed for many various reasons. Uh, but a lot of them all coming back to the same reason. They found the Vatican at the center of this evil. And they weren't afraid to try and expose it. How about Philip Kronzer? Remember him when he came on my show? Wealthy businessman from Northern California whose wife was basically brainwashed and kidnapped at Medjugorje, you know, where they had one of their other phony Mother Mary apparitions where they collect money, then they put it in their offshore bank accounts. Now, the Vatican has a very good setup. They have an, they can launder money through the Vatican Bank, but they also have bank accounts in the Caymans and all of these offshore places so that they can launder money, and it's a great way to do it because it takes away all of the suspicion. You know, you get all these criminal businessmen and politicians putting money through religious organizations, and man, they got it made. But that's not a cult, is it? No. Because, you know why? It's the demon in control. It's the beast in control, and what they're in control of is okay, even though they are the biggest cult known to man. So even though Tony Alamo's ministry, when compared to cults like the Mormon Church or the Vatican or others in Western society that have grown to be huge religious nightmares, he's he's like a a drop in the bucket. But when you look at what they did to these, these people, first they used them as an example 
to make sure that others realize what's going to happen to them if they begin to talk about the truth about the Vatican. And secondly, the amount of media exposure, the amount of persecution to these people, the kidnapping of their the children in the ministry, the stealing of their property, which is going on today, after this, these four or five girls that were coerced to testify against Alam, Tony Alamo, oh, they filed civil cases. And of course, one of the uh, uh, verdict, one of the outcomes was the largest civil settlement in the history of Arkansas at 500 and some million dollars against one of his ministries there. Now, if they took on the Vatican uh, in this country, that number would be like a penny in your pocket compared to what they should do, to what these people have been involved, the Vatican has been involved with. I mean, do you remember Cardinal Spellman? I mean, the one of the most powerful people in the city of New York and the country, Spelly's War, the Vietnam War. When you look at his abuses and his molestations of kids, verified by the New York Police Department, who was then covered up, man, take take all of the Vatican's property in New York and see how much that amounts to. But they're allowed to get away with murder, child abuse, pedophilia. And it goes to the highest levels. But that's okay. Because this is America, the home of the free. The home of the, you know, where freedom of religion reigns. Where you can get to the truth. You know, that is the biggest overstatement ever made in the history of this radio show. And we'll continue to make that statement. Because I'm telling you, it's not true. There is no freedom of religion. There is no freedom of the press in this country. And I'll tell you, let me check the time here. Yeah, we got a few minutes. And the reason there isn't is because we have allowed the beast to take over this country. And if you don't believe me, check out the roles of your highest politicians and see who they really work for. See what the, their oaths that they take through either Skull and Bones, Knights of Malta, whatever, or their, you know, leisurely visits to the Pope to kiss his ring. Let's see where it all goes. I said a long time ago, all roads lead to Rome. Now, back to Tony Alam. Remember Waco? Yeah, they had to do that. The commercial success of Alamo's ministry brought the attention of Kian, the front group for the Vatican, who accused him of holding his members as slaves. And keeping them under mind control. And, you know, after that raid in 2008, I just did a little survey of Falk, Arkansas, that home of freedom, that home of where you can go out and speak your mind, right? Yeah, that'll be the day. And I called just out of the blue after the raid took place, All the biz a lot of businesses in town, and I asked them what they thought about the Alamo ministry. And, my God, they sounded like... Sound bites off CNN, sound bites from Oprah Winfrey, sound bites from the newspapers who were all fronting and telling lies about what these people were really about. Oh, they didn't like. You know what? They used to, the ministry pa has passed out millions of brochures pinning the Vatican with crimes against humanity. That's what this is all about. You can't do that in America. Because... You know, you can't tell people that the Vatican was in bed with Hitler and that Western banks and the Vatican funded that war that killed all your friends and neighbors. No, no, no. That's not right here. We want to go on with this myth because it's easier. But all these people were doing was trying to get to the truth, and that's why they were labeled a cult. Now, back to this article from 1976 through 1994. And we're going, now we're not even talking from 94 till 2014, which really, you know, we've discussed that. But uh, 
Various government agencies investigated Alamo's operation at the direction of CAN. Multiple lawsuits, they were always fighting what were initiated against them by such agencies as the IRS and the Labor Department. Uh, the religious communes were defined as personal property owned personally by Alamo. And a 91 court judgment initiated by Ken gave the IRS the power to confiscate all church property and businesses for alleged tax deficiencies. Now, that's a double standard, because what about the Vatican in all of their religious communes, in all of the money that, you know, what about the scams that they get involved with where they buy? Now, I remember one in Chicago, my hometown, uh, HUD, you know, the housing uh, department for the poor, sells all their property to the Vatican for a dime on the dollar, a penny on the dollar. The Vatican then gets tax money to improve the property, put on putting in Catholic institutions, or reselling it for a huge profit with your tax money, but that's okay. You know, and we could go on and on about the double standard that's being used here, just in these IRS cases. We're not talking about how they brought child abuse charges against Alamo that were unfounded. And then finally they had to figure out a way in 2008, and they used this archaic Man Act, and go look up what that is, to uh, frame this guy. Now... Uh, this was back before this raid. Armed IRS agents. Now, what the hell are IRS agents doing being armed? What were they? Armed with their sharpened pencils? And marshals. Back then. Ejected homeless people from an Arkansas commune in the dead of winter. Yeah, they took these people back even in the 90s and stuck them out in the dead of winter. Why don't they go to St. Peter's Square and, and throw all those rich priests into the cold of night? Let them sleep under a bridge for a while. It'll never happen. Now, over one million worth of property was seized back then across the country, ten times the amount of the alleged tax deficiency. The property was then sold to a can lawyer in a clear sweetheart deal disguised as an auction. So back then what they were really doing is stealing money, stealing property, and disguising it as a fair auction, giving it to insiders that are privy or that have Vatican connections or work really for them, you know, as their front men. Why don't they do that to uh, one of these big parishes somewhere where the priest has been charged with molesting or found to be molesting hundreds of kids? But then these these stories are covered up. The priest is then sent to some swanky place where they supposedly rehabilitate him on a golf course or something where he's got, you know, the uh, living the life of Riley. Or they send him to another pl another church facility, a monastery somewhere in another part of the world where he can do the same thing. But they're not a cult, and they're not child abusers, no. They're a the representatives of Christ on earth, aren't they, people? And that's what you like to believe, American people, don't you? And then you like to demonize these people for, you know, Bible-believing Christians who criticize the Vatican. That's exactly what goes on, isn't it? Yep, it's exactly what goes on. Why does it go on? Because you like it that way. Back in three minutes on the Investigative Journal. Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Have you seen the Left Behind movies? Have you read the Left Behind fictional book series? Not everyone believes Left Behind is true prophecy. 
some may even regard as conspiratorial, the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. Because they see the world stage shaping to fulfill what they have been led to believe is sound biblical interpretation, a left behind rapture scenario. This false view of prophecy is reinforced in the mind, not only of its adherents, but also includes those who have been merely exposed to the specific media. Is it possible that false prophecy can be fulfilled? The rapture theories have always been in dispute. Pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib disputes have risen up in exclusively evangelical circles of recent history. So that when true believers don't suddenly disappear, this element will easily go by the wayside when all see a new Jewish temple begin to be built. Will this be part of the great delusion that will come upon the whole earth? It seems that this great prophetic delusion has already overcome practically the entire American evangelical and Christian world. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. To learn more, visit CrossTheBorder.org. That's C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit discountgoldandsilvertrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Okay, welcome back to the Investigative Journal on this April 13th, 2015 day on our calendar. This is the second half hour on this Monday, and we're going over the uh, persecution of the Alamo Christian ministry and going way back into the 90s, showing you that there's been a pattern of government and Vatican harassment through the use of this cult awareness network, CAN, this organization that is set up to basically... Uh, weed out and persecute anybody who criticizes the Vatican. I like to say things the way they really are. And I found this uh, article written back in the 90s, which is helping me understand and helping you understand really what's going on, this double standard that's used, and actually how the Vatican is probably the biggest cult in the world. (laughs) And everybody seems to like that. Yes, the majority of Americans are quite happy with this double standard and quite happy putting people in jail, framing people who criticize the beast. Now, armed IRS agents back in ninety in in the nineties uh, came and ejected homeless people from these ministries and put them out in the dead of winter. Over a hundred million worth of property was seized across the country. Ten times the amount of the alleged tax deficiency. Property was then sold, like I said, to a Cult Awareness Network lawyer in a clear sweetheart deal, disguised as an auction. Hmm. Then I told you how Vatican gets involved with uh, buying property a penny on the dollar from the government and reselling it back or using your tax money to uh, improve the property. But that's okay. And by the way, they don't pay a single dime in tax either. Now, in that case, back in the 90s with the Alamo Ministry property, the property was sold at well below its market value, and the can lawyer, Peter uh, Georgidis, resold it for a huge profit, using 
you know, he's using Vatican strategy that they do. They've done this millions of times all over the world. Not satisfied with confiscating the church property, which had provided the way out for thousands of former uh, people, you know, supposed dregs of the world, and dividing the profits from these dregs labor division between themselves and Can Associate, the government also sought to imprison Alamo. So they wanted to take the property, they wanted to take the profits, pocket that, but then they also wanted to imprison him. Now, they're doing the same, they did the same thing in 2008, and they're going, it's going on right now. The, the wholesale stealing of this property, of this ministry, it's going on right now. They succeeded in 1994 by creating the legal fiction that the church's property was Alamo's personal property. Now, why don't we take an example? Why don't we take a, oh, I don't know, how about St. John Brebuff Parish in Niles, Illinois, near where I went to grade school? And why don't we sell, why don't we say that that's not tax exempt and really the Pope owns it? And so he should be imprisoned for the child abuse cases that he covered up, that we can prove that Ratzinger, when he was Pope, covered up with documents. Oh, but that doesn't happen. No. But in this case, they create a fiction that the property is his, not the church's, under the same playing field that the Vatican plays under. But that's okay. They can do that here. Why don't they do it to the Pope, or why don't they do it to one of their cardinals, or one of their bishops, or one of their priests? Because they are the beast. And people like it that way. That's what they want in America. They want this fiction of freedom to go on. They want this double standard to be played out. They want to live under the, the idea that uh, everything that their belief system that they've got regarding religion, regarding the country, is true, what they've been told by their leaders, and nothing is going to change that. But now, before, now Tony's in jail for 175 years, but in 1994, he was sentenced to six years in prison. Now, I said a long time ago, they do this to people like him. They did it to Tuprasasi, who wrote the book Rulers of Evil, pinning the Jesuit order to all of, you know, to the same corruption in the Vatican, to the same corruption throughout history. They did the same thing to him. And really what that is is a, a warning it's like, okay, we're going we're gonna to get you on this and put you in jail for a while. If you shut up, we'll leave you alone. Just come out and work with us. But Tony didn't. But looking back on this, he was sentenced to six years in prison. In June of 95, though, uh, Tony Lamo was recommended for parole by a parole examiner because he was considered a model prisoner. Federal Parole Commission, however, overturned the examiner's recommendation. <laughs> I wonder why. The decision to deny parole was justified by information supplied by guess who? The Cult Awareness Network. And the commission used the fascist organization's language to justify that denial. The commission said Alamo should be kept in prison because he exerted unusually strong control over very vulnerable religious followers, using destitute people, unwed young mothers and children to bring in money in exchange for living in subjects' religious compound. Note the word compound here. We never hear of the Archdiocese of Chicago as a compound, do we? That's probably one of the biggest compounds in the world along with their other compounds. But we call those Christian dioceses that represent the word of Christ. You know, remember what my favorite archbishop said from Chicago, who basically 
was the head of the Vatican Bank when I was in Rome in the 80s. Now, Father Cardinal Paul Marcin, or Archbishop Paul Marchinkas, had no banking experience, but he was a good money launderer. He was nailed for bank fraud and, you know, was a suspect in a, a murder of a bank president. But he lived the life of Riley to his old age in Phoenix, transported out of Rome, and he said this. My favorite quote of all time, telling you exactly what the Vatican's all about, but that's okay. We like it that way. He said, you can't run a church on Hail Marys. <laughs> oh, boy. But anyway, so they, the Cult Awareness Network wants to teach him a lesson, or the Vatican wants to teach Tony a lesson, and said, now you got to stay in jail a little longer. Uh You know, and this article said, one cannot help noting the irony in this pretended concern for the destitute, which Alamo's, uh, which Alamo's people help. The government drove those, you know, they want to act as if they're helping these people, protecting them from Tony Alamo. When the government's the one throwing people out on the street. When the government today is taking 30, you know, took over... Th- 35 of the children from that ministry and basically ruin their lives. Putting them into foster care. Uh, Now the government which drove these people back into the street and took away possibly their first healthy opportunity in life. This government and the Vatican which then consumed the profits from the very tools these people used to liberate themselves, to make some money, to live a better life. This government then, back in the 90s, just like they do now, cries great tears of concern to protect these people. Government really, and this article said it well, wants them back as hookers, crooks, and druggies so they can profit off of them, put them in jail as clients for its social fascist state. Obviously, Tony Alamo's greatest crime in all of this is that he used the gospel to compete with the government. (laughs) Helping these people instead of allowing the government to have their people, the people they want, like you, right out there listening, who they want to turn into a druggie, a crook, a, uh, a hooker, or whatever, just so they can make money off of you. And so this fascist state goes on and on and on. And that was back in the 90s. And let me tell you, it ain't much better now. Now, I promised I wanted to go back and look at a motion for a trial that sat on a judge's... His re, he, he was trying to... to Tony was trying to, in in this system that is so, you know, corrupt, this court system that he got involved in, uh, where he had no chance. But by going over his motion for a new trial, which was denied, by the way, now there's another small motion, there's another appeal out there. However, he's hanging on a string right now, his, his freedom. And all we can do is pray that someday he can be released so you can you see this hypocrisy that's going on right now um, in his motion and I like sometimes to bring the legality into this and show you how the criminal how this procedure how nothing matters I mean they bring up can too they bring up the cult awareness network in this but he had about 20 points in this short motion for new trial. And the court committed, I think, thousands of errors when you look at this case. But let's consider some of the ones here. Now we're moving to 2008. So during those years, Tony's ministry grew from the time he got out of jail uh, for that bogus IRS charge. Instead of keeping quiet and doing what the Vatican wanted him to do, he talked even more putting on numerous radio shows all over the world, spending thousands and thousands of dollars on shortwave airtime, on sending brochures uh, 
worldwide. Today, even though he sits in jail, his ministry website still gets over 300,000 hits a week. They're still sending out documents. And despite the media barrage against him, which started after 150 news outlets were notified about this 2008 raid, where he wasn't even there. They, they came on like stormtroopers, and all they found was kids playing on a swing set. And we went over some of the testimony of people that were there that showed you what these goons were all about. But the court committed error one here by denying Tony's motion to suppress. The motion, I mean, a lot of the, it, it was so interesting in this trial that all this damning information, extraneous information, came out against him supposedly. But they wouldn't even allow one of the undercover agents to testify that basically his superiors, and he was naming names, we're saying they wanted to frame Alamo and get anything you can, plant guns, kill him if you have to. But that doesn't get in. Because that would have shown a pattern that the government was wrong from day one. And, you know, the people on the jury from Fork, Arkansas, couldn't take that. That would destroy their whole belief system, wouldn't it? That would mean they would have to go back. How could they find a fair trial in Falk, Arkansas? I mean, I called, <laughs> you know, at least this case should have been moved, change of venue, to a place where, you know, I mean, he wasn't as well-known all over the world, I mean, all over the United States, and it showed you that they made a motion to move the trial, and it should have been, because I called it after... He was a, after this case came out in the big newspapers and everything was splashed all over that he was guilty, I called a number of the businesses there just out of the clear blue saying, hey, what would you think of the Alam movement? How, every one of them basically spewed out what the newspapers were saying. So I said, I can't get a fair trial in Falk, Arkansas, that small little town. But that's where... The case went on right over there in that backyard of where everybody was really in, uh, indoctrinated and poisoned to hate these people. So that's huge. And they could have found a place that was at least a bit fair, don't you think? The court committed error by denying defendants' motion to suppress. The motion was based on stale information and an affidavit supporting the search warrant, as well as no indicia of informant reliability nor any statements of reliability to get a search warrant to even get on that property. But that doesn't matter. Thus, all evidence collected during the September 20, 2008 search should have been ruled inadmissible. Now, I don't even think they found anything anyway. I know that, you know, there was this talk from one of the uh, informants that I talked to that kind of was telling the truth about the FBI and left the FBI. Uh, he said basically uh, they were going to try to get him on pornography on the computers, but there wasn't any on the computers, and they didn't even bother taking the computers. So basically the whole idea was to shut this ministry down. The court committed error by failing to require the government to reveal the identity of the two informants. So they didn't even have to reveal who their accusers were. And those were probably people that were lying. And secondly, the one the informants that were going to tell the truth weren't allowed to testify. So right there, man... If this ain't a kangaroo court, what is? Are you going to get a fair trial? Then you got these jury, these people from Fork, Fork, Arkansas, who might as well just have thrown, you know, come in and say, hey, just put him in jail and hang him, you know, like they did in the old days. Because they, for him to get a fair trial in that town was ridiculous. The court committed error by refusing to have you know, I say this, the court committed a big error by just opening its doors. It should have just 
saved everybody a lot of money and just said, listen, Heil Hitler, we don't like him. He's going down. That's all they should have done, just like they did back in Nazi Germany. And that, I mean, forget this garbage of, you know, showing the world you're giving a fair trial when you're not. The court committed error by refusing to have the government reveal their original notes of interviews of witnesses and further refusing to inspect in camera the notes in camera the notes of the government agents or at least to order them preserved with the court so what happens here is they interview people in the beginning they don't want their notes talked about because they did at that time maybe these witnesses didn't or probably didn't have they didn't have time enough to coerce them because then they sent them over to the cult awareness network and were kept kind of you know their promised things and they're and do you think that maybe their testimonies changed? Now, if they would have revealed the court notes that were originally taken or the notes by these government agents that were originally taken, they might have seen there's a, there's a discrepancy here. But so they didn't even have to really give anything. Now, the, comor- the court committed another error by refusing the defense request to see and inspect the, the the records of Wellspring Counseling Center. Now that's the Wellspring Counseling Center is now it's either the equivalent of the Cult Awareness Network, but it's the same thing. And that's where they sent these kids along as government witnesses. The records uh, witnesses there. This is especially true since the credibility of these witnesses was the ultimate issue in the case. But they didn't allow, the court said, that's not important. You see what they were doing over there, coercing these witnesses along. And the FBI was right there at the Wellspring Counseling Center. Now this, so none of this is, the jurors don't get to hear anything. And you know why? Because they're covering up exactly what was going on. And he's getting a fair trial. Use your common sense, people. So anyway, now the court then committed error by refusing the defense request to see and inspect records of Wellspring Counseling Center as the government witnesses, Colbeck, and all these witnesses, you know the names, I put them on my show, I won't bother uh, going over it again. This is especially true since the credibility of these witnesses was the ultimate issue in the whole case. Now, the court then committed error by refusing defendant's request to see and inspect all the FBI's 302 witnesses, the witness interviews. And that means, you know, there were other people involved here, even though the government said they did not have any, that they had not turned over to the defense. The testimony of witnesses shows that there were repeated and numerous interviews by law enforcement that were never turned over. So they didn't want to turn this over to show that there was a pattern of harassment of these witnesses. And I've had some of them on my show, and I've read you certain things. And next, you know, maybe not tomorrow, but Wednesday, I'll do, I've got a few letters of people who show you that they've been harassed by the FBI to try to get them to turn, to change, to lie. But none of this gets into the court records. Why? Because, you know, common sense tells you if they heard this, you know, the jury might not convict him. Correct? Yeah, exactly. Huh. Now... There's a lot more in this motion for retrial that, you know, I bet the judge didn't even bother reading it, you know, because they really, all they got to do is rubber stamp it and say, no, uh, we're not going to listen. And that's basically it. So I just wanted to give you a taste of this kangaroo court. And like I said before, If I was a kangaroo, I wouldn't want my name even associated with this. You know, kangaroos have put up with a lot. 
you know, having their name disparaged throughout the course of history, you know, especially with our legal system, as cool as it's set up, but as criminal as it is. And this one takes the cake, so even the kangaroos were contacting me going, we don't want to be associated with this case. But anyway, uh, they have a point. So, I've showed you what was going, the pattern of what's happened here. I've shown you, in many cases, all these kids, you know, a lot of these kids that were kidnapped, and we've done shows on this, still haven't seen their parents, and that happened in 2008. And they're in worse shape now in the foster care system. And remember the shows they did on the foster care system last week? Showing that, you know, it's worse to get in those systems than it is, you know, to stay out of it and all the corruption that goes on there. So anyway, uh, we'll be back on the investigative journal tomorrow. I, later in the week, I'll, I'll continue with this show. Later in the week, I'll continue uh, talking. I want to talk more about the foster care system. I want to talk more about uh, a Georgia senator who basically her husband and her were supposedly, in quotes, suicided after she was a, just a... Uh, relentless critic of what was going on all across the country. That's an interesting story that's been forgotten. So take, uh, have a good evening and good night. Gold and silver is tremendously undervalued. Global demand vastly exceeds mine supply by more than 60% annually. There is little in the financial world more certain than a coming explosion in the prices of gold and silver. The U.S. dollar continues to lose value and respect as the world's reserve currency. Our nation faces challenges on many fronts, and a day doesn't pass without another economist bringing forth warnings of impending economic calamity. There has never been a better time than right now to acquire physical gold and silver. Discount Gold and Silver Trading was founded on the principles of truth and honesty. We believe in providing a quality product, quality service, and most importantly, competitive pricing. We provide all forms of precious metals, including American gold, silver, platinum, and rare investment and circulated coins. Silver bars, rounds, and 90% silver bags are on hand for the silver investor. Gold self-directed IRAs are available. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, that's 1-800-375-4188. American Family News, I'm Chris Woodward. 
The Pentagon says Islamic State fighters have lost up to 6,500 square miles in Iraq. Pentagon spokesman and Colonel Steve Warren. ISIL is no longer the dominant force in roughly 25 to 30 percent of the populated areas of Iraq, where it once had complete freedom of movement. Meanwhile, don't call it a victory yet. The Pentagon says the Islamic State has maintained its overall area of control in Syria. Senator Marco Rubio of Florida is running for president. He joins